I'd like to share with you from uh, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, if you've got your Bibles, if you can turn there, and the first 13 verses from Luke chapter 4. And uh, about a month and a half back, I was awake at night and it was quite late. And I felt God say to me, just get up and I want to just share something with you. So when I got up, I went to the lounge and on the way there, I felt this word Luke chapter 4. And uh, when I went and had a look at Luke chapter 4, I remembered the scripture was about Jesus when he goes into the wilderness. He goes into the wilderness and he's tempted for 40 days. And uh, it, many, many times I've heard people share on this and the devil definitely tested him on his identity. Am I right? But this morning, I want us to have a look at three self-temptations that Jesus helps us with in this passage of Scripture. Is that okay? The three temptations have become important in my own life to overcome. And I, I want to share this with you because it really helped me in a difficult place. And sometimes when you're in a hard place and you're not sure about where the next meal is coming from or the next year, what's going to happen. Last week we shared about what little we have. We look up like Jesus did and he fed 5,000 people. Remember that story? And this over here, three self-temptations that Jesus helps us with. So I'm going to share, Jesus is led into the wilderness. He's just come off the high of his baptism. He's just been endorsed by the Father publicly. He's been set up in his ministry. And the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit does. And so often, when we've just come out of a great space, and we've just come out of a great victory, with the Lord, we get led into the hardest of times in the area of provision or the area of promotion or the area of protection. Those are the three areas I'm going to be sharing in. And he's sitting in this place. So 40 days, he neither eats bread or drinks water. He's sitting and he's waiting and he's living on the Word of God. Okay, so how many of us have been in that wonderful high and then all of a sudden there's this huge low and you're in a place where you suddenly don't know what's going to happen next. How many of us live in that situation? How many of us have been there? But that's a fantastic place to be at. Because without the wilderness, Jesus wouldn't have had his ministry. Jesus wouldn't have been able to choose the right disciples. Jesus wouldn't have been able to become all of what he, what he was. He had to go through the same temptations that we do. So the wilderness is a very real place for all of us. Am I right? But it's a good place. And it's a good place to be in. So, Elijah is another man that was in a wilderness. Just after he kills the 400 prophets of Baal, he thinks this is fantastic and he gets a murderous threat from Jezebel that she is going to murder him. And he just picks up his heels and he runs into the wilderness. For a whole day, he runs into the wilderness. He shouldn't have even been in the wilderness. But what's amazing is that in his wilderness experience, God feeds him when he's desperate. He, he lies down and says, Lord, just take me home now because I've, there's nothing left and I'm, I'm, I'm ruined. I'm, I need to go now. And he falls asleep and an, an angel provides a meal for him and then wakes him up again after he falls asleep and provides again. And then on the strength of that food, he travels 40 days and God speaks to him again. Isn't that amazing? Moses, the, another example to us, he goes up to, to spend time with God in the mountain. And as he's up there, there's no food, there's no water. He's living on what God is downloading to him. Friends, I want to make this very clear to us today. That provision is not for you to provide for yourself. God provides for his sheep. God provides for us. He always does. Whether you've got a great job or whether you are unemployed, God will never leave us nor forsake us. We have Elijah that shouldn't have been in the wilderness. God still provides for him. We have Moses who should have been up in the mountain, and that's where he was. God still provides for him without food or water. Jesus gets prepared for his ministry without food and water. Whether he was meaning to fast or not, I don't know. I don't believe, it says in one of the translations that he was fasting, which means that he wasn't eating. But in most of the translations, it just says that he hadn't eaten anything and he was very hungry. 
I mean, come on, I think I'd be very hungry by the 40th day. But that, funny enough, is where the devil tempts him. And so the first of these three self-temptations that I'd like to share with us is this one over here, the temptation of self-provision. It says here, and the devil said to him, if you, this is in verse 3 to 4, if you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him saying, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. It's amazing. He had in any other circumstance he provided and he used his powers to provide for the people or for himself or whatever. In any other circumstance, it was okay for him to use the power that God had given him. And friends, the temptation comes when hardship comes our way in the wilderness for us to use the power that God has given to us for us. And it's in that moment that the word was more important and Jesus was living off the word of God. He was living off the word that was in him rather than the power that was at his disposal. How many times have we found ourselves in a place where we are desperate and we are praying that God provides for us? That's okay. But we need to know in a wilderness, in a situation where God is wanting us to focus on him, Jesus knew not to use his power. He never used his power to override God's intention. We need to be careful that we never use God's power to override God's intention in our lives. Because what God was doing, He was preparing His Son to literally turn the world around. And His Son, as a human, needed to know the Father's provision even in the wilderness. Is that okay? For us that are sitting in that wilderness place, for us that may not even be in that wilderness place, believe it or not, whatever you think is providing for you, it's God. He can bring it and He can take it away. But the wonderful thing is in the wilderness that the Word of God becomes our food. So that when we come out of the wilderness, we will never again rely on what's provided for us up front. Does that make sense? Obedience is most tested in desert places. Obedience because... Satan says to him, he has a stone, you can turn it into bread. Because he knew that Jesus had the capacity to do that. Because he, funny enough, friends, he was already finished his fasting. He was finished the 40 days. He was just about to move into the breakthrough. And most of us in the moment, just before God's going to bring great breakthrough and great blessing and great favor, is the moment we use what's at our disposal for ourselves. When it comes to finances, talking like what Jono was saying, our finances are the greatest test of that thing. When you're in the wilderness, what are you going to do? Because your default needs to be to the Word of God. And that is faith. Because faith is being sure of what we hope for and confident of the things that we can't see. Temptation to, to short-circuit God's preparation in us before a real responsible task comes our way. Friends, most of us sit in a situation just before God's going to give us something great, which leads us to the second self-temptation. And this one, number two, is the temptation of self-promotion. The temptation of self-promotion, friends. First of all, we want to provide for ourselves. And second of all, we want to be recognized for it. We want to be recognized for how hard we work. We want to be recognized. We want to promote ourselves. We want to become the leaders. We want to become... The, the big heroes, and there's a, really only one hero, and that's always going to be Jesus, it says in verse 5, Then the devil, taking up, up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, this, All this authority I will give to you and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, I wonder by who, <laughs> and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and says to him, said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and in him only you shall serve. Isn't that an amazing, isn't that an amazing response to great power? 
been given to this man. Jesus even knew that promotion was something that comes from God. He was promoted the minute that he, his father endorses him as he comes out of the water. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He's endorsed. He's made authentic in a sense. Look at the Israelites. The same thing happens. Two totally different responses in the wilderness. The Israelites in Egypt get delivered. They get endorsed. They, they, they put the blood over the posts of the doors and the angel of death passes over them. And the miracle signs and wonders had just happened. The plagues had all happened. They'd seen the miraculous hand of God. But you know what happens? They get, they get led out into a wilderness straight away. Two totally different responses. Israelites, people, humans, versus Jesus. The Israelites knew one thing, that they had abundance of pots of meat and food available. They were not fasting going into the wilderness. They were expecting to be provided for exactly the same way as they had in Egypt, even if it meant slavery. They were used to slavery, but they weren't used to trusting God for their daily bread. They complain. They complain, and all of a sudden there's consequences that come their way. I want to just say this. This is a particularly dangerous one. It's very easy for us to fall for fame. It's very easy for us to want to be recognized for the service in the kingdom. The most unrecognized place you will ever be in is in the ministry. Because all of us are called to the ministry to do what? It's to serve and to lay our lives down for other people. God has not taught me a greater lesson than to lay down my life for people in a time that nobody likes and everybody makes jokes about do you know what? Joke's on them. Joke's on them. Because you know what? I lay, I've laid my life down for eight years. Eight years in Brackpan. And is there great fruit from it? I believe so. Is there this great fame? No. I probably get laughed at more than anyone else. But you know what the thing is? I have learned to live in the provision of God. You learn to fight the lion and the bear in the wilderness. Jesus was looking after a small number of sheep. He had no recognition. There was, ah, oh, sorry, Jesus, David was looking after him. None of you corrected me just by the way. Where's Greg? I'm very glad he's not here. And what happens? He gets promoted immediately into the presence of the king. Because he loved them. And he served his father by looking after those dusty sheep in the middle of nowhere, Brackpan. The sheep in Brackpan, type set up. But God teaches him to overcome. God teaches him that promotion is from God alone. Because nobody saw him in the wilderness. In fact, his own brothers thought of him as less. And even the prophet that came and anointed as king saw him as less. He saw the taller one, he saw the more successful looking one, he saw everyone else but David. I want to encourage you. Let's be sure that we don't try and self-promote in the wilderness because we are serving, we're paying the price. It may be hard at times, but this ministry is not just about being hard. It's about incredible blessing, incredible favor, but let God do that. Sometimes God wants you to have great fame. But your testing time is needed so that when you get what you need, you won't self-destroy. If you are not prepared for what God's promotion is for your life and you short-circuit that process, what happens is you then fall to pieces very soon. I can't tell you how many men and women I've seen in the church that go into the wilderness and Satan presents an opportunity that looks like it's deliverance and a quick, a quick fix to come out of the wilderness. And pretty soon the cracks appear. And they isolate themselves. And they start making mistakes. And they start drifting away from the body. Too many times when people have gone into the wilderness is where they try and make things happen. In the wilderness, we don't make anything happen. In the wilderness, we sit and wait on God. Until He says it's time to come out. Until we're hungry. And then Satan comes and tests us, and he tries us in every area. 
bowing down to, to Satan. What, did it, what would it mean to bow down and worship the devil? I mean, how, we, we, don't, we don't really see Satan standing there and we bow down to him. You know what I mean? I mean, what would he look like? I think of him as very ugly and horrible. And I'd love to have a round with him in heaven one day or outside, wherever it is, just a real brack pen scrap. Because that's what, that's what we do best. And so once he's been defeated, I wouldn't mind just a few rounds. Just with the backing of Jesus, hopefully. So bowing down to Satan is not so obvious. Simple. This is the first one. How do we bow down to Satan? The first one, simple disobedience to authority. The quickest way to bow down to Satan is that we become rebellious towards authority. The second thing is not trusting in God's word. Trusting in our own ability. Trusting in our own provision. Trusting in what we think we deserve. We want to be promoted. We, we, we're going to promote ourselves out of this hardship. We're going to quickly take that loan. We're going to quickly go for that job. We're going to just do this. I've been suffering for 10 years or 20 years. Now it's time for me to be promoted. You know what? Jesus suffered for 33 years. He didn't have it easy. He was born in a manger. He never had any great fame. Uh, he never had any great um, riches. He never even had property. When someone said, I want to come and follow you, he says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. This was 30 years into his life. By then we should have a home. Am I right? Jesus didn't look very successful. And the third one is this, isolation from our Christian brothers. The first thing we do when hardship comes our way in the wilderness is we isolate ourselves from community. We isolate ourselves from the help. I mean, he was isolated. Yes, we know. There are times when, have you ever been in a really tough situation? Everyone says they're there for you and you pick up the phone and you phone all 10 of those connections and none of them are available. That's when you need to look to Jesus. But we don't stay there. Jesus uses people to help us. Number four, lusting after things and living to gain, gain them at any cost. That's when that self-promotion comes out. I am going to get that car. I am going to get that. Goals are good. But they need to be set in that place. And very often it's in the wilderness where God gives us the future. He gives us and prepares us for what God has called us to. The third and final one is this, friends. The temptation of self-protection. The temptation of self-protection. It says, yeah, then, then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. He had already said to Satan, Get behind me, go away. And Satan wasn't finished yet. Satan wasn't done yet. He led him up to that up to that pinnacle. I mean, I don't know how he listened to Satan to go up to the top of the pinnacle of the temple, but he did because he was overcoming. He was destroying. He was already starting to destroy Satan's power. He was already starting to show him, this is not Eve that's going to be tempted to protect myself. Friends, it's like going to, going to go and bungee jump. And as you're about to, to bungee jump, you say, Lord Jesus, just protect me. Thank you that you protect me as I jump off this thing and potentially put myself in danger. That's okay. Many of, I'd love to do blow crans. I still would love to do it. I have done a bungee jump before. But for me to say, Jesus, thank you. I'm putting myself in this situation. Make sure that I don't die because I've got a calling on my life. You know what I mean? It's like, mm, maybe we should just... And I thought to myself, there's no reason for me to go and do blow crans. You know why? Because my life is like a bungee jump every day in Brackban. Sometimes the cord feels strong and sometimes it feels like it's, it's not so strong. And so we don't need to put ourselves in risky situations unnecessarily. Because this calling of God that he, that he takes you and is so exhilarating, is so fantastic. Look at Paul in the, isle, in the island of Patmos. He's on a journey to get to Rome. He's on a ship and the safest people in the whole world were those people that were around Paul. Do you know why? 
Because God had a plan to take Paul and the gospel from Jerusalem to Rome. When we are on the mission of God and we're doing what we are called to do, God will protect us. There's no need for us to put ourselves in unnecessarily risky situations. It's going to be risky enough in this gospel. And walking in faith and walking in the call of God. There's no need for us to even think about trying to protect ourselves. Australia is not the, is not the protected place of the world. It may not be so safe for everyone to go to. The safest place is when you are in the will of God and you know your purpose that God is calling you to. And then if He does call you to Guatemala or to Ethiopia or to Mongolia or to the outer ends of the earth where there isn't any provision, God will protect you. So I want to encourage you with this. That Satan used something all throughout these temptations as he twisted Scripture. He made Scripture suit his angle. And if you look at this specific one, he's talking about Psalm 91. His contextualization of this Scripture is totally out. God's protection is promised, if you look at the beginning of that, is when we dwell in the shelter of His wings. Dwelling in the shelter of God's wings is not just reading His Word, never being on mission, never sharing this gospel, never getting into the community, never getting into the things of God. But it's actually in the will of God. It's fulfilling the will of God, and that's the safest place. Being in God's will is the safest place, the safest place for us. The safest place is in God's will. The worst and most risky place is to be in your own created safe place. Let's not live in that very bad zone, the comfort zone. That comfort zone is a place where the devil wins in our lives. If you're looking at a situation and you know that there's no provision for that and God is calling you to that, that's the safest place to be in. But it doesn't mean we always do stupid things. God will give you the right time and the right place. But the best place to hear it is in community and in the body of Christ. The conclusion, friends, is this. It's a simple message. It really is. There's not much to it. Self-provision, self-promotion, and self-protection. They all start with self. And not one of them is actually for us to provide. God sorts all three of those out at any time and all the time. And this I want to say, friends, we live on the Word in desert places. We don't desert the Word in desert places. We don't resort to our own provision, promotion and protection. It is the job of the Lord and they will never be yours. They're always for Him to provide.